welcome back. This is video three of three of the Moog Taurus refurbishment project. If you made it this far, my hat's off to you. I've really had a fun time working on this thing. I hope you've enjoyed watching it. In this last video, we're going to be replacing these electrolytic capacitors in the power supply circuit board and a couple in the main circuit board. And as recommended by Moog in a, in a maintenance release they gave out in the late 70s, we are going to re be replacing these potentiometers with CERMET, ceramic metallic potentiometers, and those do better in a high heat uh, situation, don't uh, drift as much, which gives better pitch stability. And uh, after we're done with that, we're going to be uh, putting it back together, kind of uh, getting a few extra parts and finishing it all up. So let's get right to it. So I started by removing the power supply circuit board from this fiber board here. I think I'm going to use this later on. There was supposed to have been some fiber board at the keyboard uh, that's a slightly smaller shape as so I'm probably going to cut this to to match uh, what it was supposed to have been there and it's long gone. But we're going to replace these electrolytic capacitors. There's uh, essentially a, an insulating liquid in these embedded in the paper, in the paper rolls. After a few decades, it evaporates, the capacitance goes down, they don't work as well. So uh, this thing is four decades old. We need, to, we need to replace these. Notice that the new one is a lot smaller than the old one. That's, you can just attribute that to progress in the industry. So let's get started. I'm going to uh, desolder these, starting on this back side. Just take them off and put the new ones on. To remove the capacitor, I've got the board secured lightly in a vise. I'm heating up the solder side of the board and just pulling on the capacitor. We're not going to reuse the capacitor, so I'm not really worried about the heat from the soldering iron damaging it. And we're going to clean out the solder holes and put the new capacitor in its place. After cleaning out the holes, just take the new capacitor, bend the leads, and insert it right into the holes. Put a heat sink on the leads to protect the new capacitor and do the soldering. Trim the leads. And we're done. All right, so far I've replaced five electrolytic capacitors in this power supply circuit board. Now that we're done with that, let's go over to the main circuit board. Okay, what we're going to do here is replace six of these integrated circuit variable resistors with new CERMET variable resistors as well as a fixed resistor in series with it. Now each of these things right now is actually two things in one. It's a, a variable resistor in series with a fixed resistor in each one of these. So when we replace it, we're going to have to replace it with two things, except for this one. This one only has the variable component the fixed resistor portion isn't actually hooked up to anything but for one two three four five we're going to replace those with two items this one with one item and uh, we're also going to replace these two electrolytic capacitors all right i got a couple of these done already and one of the things i've learned along the way is that desoldering the six to 10 points of these things in one shot is really difficult. This one's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight solder points, and it's not really worth it. Uh, so, what I've been doing this may shock you, but I've been doing a little of this I just pry the whole thing up because we're not going to use it again. And then I use a pair of pliers, or sometimes just my hand, to get the rest of the way off. Uh, I'm going to cut away and do it, but essentially that's the deal. You're better off just taking these things off by force than cleaning out the holes to uh, add the new rheostats in there, uh, rather than trying to desolder all of them. It just takes too much time. Okay, I got it completely off. Now, the pinning of these things, if you're looking at the schematic the, that's downloadable online, uh, it'll say, right here, it says 1, 5, and then 13. Those pins correspond to 1, 2, 3, imaginary, 4, 5, and you got to imagine 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 
13, 14, 15, 16. So in our case, we're dealing with one and five, which are tied together on the other side, and 13. And we're going to put the new one in for the schematic. I have replaced one, two, three, four, five, six potentiometers with these new CERMET potentiometers and have added some resistors, one, two, three, four, five, actually this one was already there, uh, added them in series per the schematics. Now interestingly, on the back side of this there were some uh, bits of printed circuit, essentially a dead end, starting nowhere and going nowhere, ending in two terminals, which lend itself really well to placing these resistors in series per the design documents. Now these weren't there before, but the printed circuit was. It's almost as if Moog had designed it to have these added later, which they may, may very well have done. So I took advantage of that, and I also replaced these two electrolytic capacitors. We're going to reassemble the whole thing and Here's hoping it works. Let's give it a shot. All right, I've got it partially reassembled and I've been testing it out. This is the tuba sound. Sounds pretty good. The bass sounds good too. Taurus. It's a little slow on the attack. I may look into that. The variable sounds good. Now, it all sounds good, except there are a few fundamental problems. First of all, this. It's supposed to be an A, and it's not an A. And while I can adjust that to a certain degree inside, uh, there's still a problem and uh, that carries over to the uh, second oscillator, and the oscillator B, uh, as well. I'm going to cut away and lift this thing up and uh, show you what's going on. Okay, I've got it opened up now, and I'm set to the tuba sound. Now, this, this potentiometer right here... Uh, controls the pitch of oscillator A. So I'm going to bring it down to about an A. It's a little bit sharper that right now. There, that's about an A. And that's all well and good for the tuba frequency. Now this one here should also adjust the tuba frequency independent of the others. It's not doing anything. So I've done something wrong there and i got to fix that. However, having said that, if I go to, say, the bass sound, and this is the, uh, that's not the Taurus frequency, this is the bass B frequency. I can't bring it down far enough. Can't even do it with frequency B. Everything is uh, a little too high on frequency B. Same is true for the Taurus. Um, let's see, this is the Taurus. Yeah, can't bring it down low enough. Now, I've I've done everything per the specs and uh, checking it over with the exception of this, it looks like I've done it right. Oddly, the resistors that I've added here, uh, here, uh, that one was already there, and this one over here uh, appear not to be large enough, even though I've done it uh, per the directions, uh, So, which is kind of odd. If I short them out, the pitch jumps even higher, and I'm trying to bring it down lower. So what I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do a little trial and error uh, work here, adding resistors of slightly larger value to get the pitch down into the right range. All right, I said I did everything per spec, but guess what? I didn't. There were a couple places where I made mistakes. Over here, this is the trim pot for the pitch of oscillator A and its complementary resistor. Uh, this resistor is specced out at 49.9K. I had put a 47K thinking that would be good enough. It turns out what I should have done is to err on the higher side. Uh, couldn't get a 49.9, and the 47K was too small, so I put a 51K resistor in there, and now it's working great. Got oscillator A tuned up properly. And then over here on oscillator B, you got the trim pot and its complementary resistor. I had put a resistor that was one-tenth of its recommended rating here. I had misread the bands, and so I got the right one in there now, and I got oscillator B tuned up right. And lastly, I mentioned I had done something wrong with this tuba um, uh, trim pot. It turns out I hadn't. The pitch for oscillator B was uh, actually going up and down as I turned it. It's just, it's so quiet compared to <laughs> that of oscillator A. It was hard to hear. So everything's, everything's good now. It's tuned up. Things are sounding really good. That's the variable sound. Taurus. Tuba and bass. All sounding great. Now we're going to put the thing back together and do some uh, cleanup on the 
outside of it to get it looking right. This is the inside of the case for the loudness pedal. It slides up and down. Now originally it had a kind of a dust cover that was glued down here and here. It's long gone and I've decided to make something that'll uh, kind of cover the, uh, cover up that hole a little bit and this is what I'm using. I've got some heavy duty black velcro, the uh, hook side, loop side, and this is some uh, thin uh, foam that I'm going to put on the back of this, uh, the cloth side. This is sticky back here on, on both these and that will give it some rigidity. I've cut them into strips of about uh, one inch by five inches long. I'm going to take the plastic loop side and stick it right next to the channel, like so. I'm going to do this on both sides. Now I'm going to take the cloth and foam and stick it right on here about halfway on so that it's actually resting against the post here. And I'm going to do that on both sides. And the end result is I have a slider guard which allows the slider to move freely, very little resistance at all, and closes up behind it as it passes. Looking at the underside of the pedal board, there should be four rubber pads here, 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 and here. This is the only one of the original ones that's left and the rubber is completely hardened. However, I'm going to leave it in place. Here I'm going to make another one. This uh, looks like a rubber pad, but it's actually just a little thing that's kind of recessed up in there. The rubber pad is gone. Uh, the metal hits the floor. So I'm going to make a new one for this and I'm also going to make a new one for this. It's not going to be too difficult. Essentially I'm going to take a rubber stopper, very similar to that one. Using a vise and a jigsaw, I'm just going to cut it to the appropriate thickness. And then just glue it in place. I'm using Gorilla Glue, but other glues probably work just as well. For just about the last step here, we're going to talk about the variables door. As you probably know, these things tend to go missing. and uh, this is the original one to this unit, which is kind of amazing. Um, they're held in by these little nubs that bump out on the plastic, and they're just sort of wedged in there. So naturally, as time goes on and the plastic kind of contracts as it gets, gets older, they, uh, they don't hold it anymore and they fall out. So what I've done, I've taken a little bit of electrical tape and just dropped it over the nub right there and there, and there are six points. One, two three, four, and I need to do it to five and six. And just take the door and slip it in place. Pressing at all six points, make sure it's in there. And now it's not coming out. I was also able to replace the magnets on the door here, 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 and here. I think some of the portions are missing, but I was able to get enough of it on there in such a way that it actually stays closed now. So we are just about done here. Okay, let's take a look here. Here's the bass sound. Those are working. Now let's take it up an octave. Tone decay. Maybe some glide. Tuba sound. The famous Taurus sound. And of course, the variable.
We got ourselves a working Taurus, y'all. Thanks for watching. Hope you had fun and maybe even learned something along the way. I sure did. Y'all take care. See you next time.